Isaiah 51, verse 1. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. The word of the Lord. Well, at some point, my son got too big, and so we stopped making our yearly treks to Florida. You know, the 20-hour drive each way. But for many years, it was a family highlight. Having lived in Florida for a decade and having moved to Michigan, not because we were dying to move to Michigan. Uh, no offense, Michiganders, but no one is dying to move to this beautiful state. Uh, but because of the same forces of market and nature and, of course, the will of the Lord, uh, the land, people in this happy but cold place, my family was just happy to make the yearly trek to Florida. We have family in Florida. We have a friend with a sweet condo in Naples he let us use for many years. He has since sold the condo, which greatly benefited his pocket but impoverished our family. And so when it seemed that God was giving us a permanent uh, or semi-permanent assignment in Michigan, we don't have any other plans, but nothing in life is permanent, my wife made me promise her that I would take her to Florida every year. Well, I've not been able to keep that promise, by the way. Uh, God's the only one who keeps all his promises. The rest of us have good intentions. But we've been back to Florida a lot since 2013 when we left. And, uh, you know, and just making the trek was a blast. We remember it most fondly. It would take us about two days to get down there. We'd always stop around the midway point at my mother-in-law's place in Tennessee. She was always a little bit salty because we'd use her place like a hotel and then kept going, which we did. You know, sorry about that, Brenda. Uh, now that you live with us, uh, you're stuck with us every day. But, um, and so we would stop. We'd always stop at Chick-fil-A and Chipotle. Do we have any, uh, any Chick Chick-fil-A and Chipotle fans here? Yeah, so good. We stopped to one for lunch the other for dinner. There were long stretches when no one was allowed to drink much of anything so that they could hold it for a few hours. Parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We'd give the kids NyQuil so they would sleep and be quiet. No, we did not. We did not do that. But the kids would sleep and they would watch movies and they would listen to music. They would tell stories and of course they would fight. It was family at its best. And then eventually, when it had been so long, we'd all forgotten why we were so cramped like pretzels in this van for so many hours, we'd roll down the windows and the sun, the breeze, the palm trees, the salty air would welcome us and make it all worth it. We'll never forget our trips to Florida. Now, I'm sure you have your own version of what I just described. What is that? What is that well etched in your mind and stored in your heart memory that fills your heart with joy and gladness, thanksgiving and singing? Well, for God's people, Israel, it was the pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Three times a year, they would go, the whole family, whenever possible, to celebrate Pentecost, weeks and tabernacles. Nothing was more important than God's people converging in God's place to celebrate God's goodness, singing and dancing, eating and drinking. It was shalom at its finest. And so you can imagine the heartache when the people are taken as exiles to Babylon for 70 years and the pilgrimages stop. Lamentations 1 verse 4 which is written in the aftermath of the devastation of exile, says the roads, the roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. And so, 
This whole section in Isaiah we've been studying for the last couple of months is about God saying to his grieving, groaning, anguished people, awake, rise up, you're going back to Zion, you're going back to Jerusalem. It's kind of like when Rafiki finds Simba in the Lion King after he's been exiled for many years from the pride and says to him, it is time. Now, there's a common metaphor that we use for life. And it's that metaphor of a journey, right? A journey. I've been watching some of the Olympics and it's on so many of the commercials, the journey of life. Where are you on your journey, right? For us, your journey of faith. You know, we have regrets from past stops along the journey. Can you think of those? We have wounds from the journey. We have doubts and fears along the journey. And journeys have destinations. And according to the Bible, for the people of God, their destination is the new world that God is in the process of making. And so today we have a word in scripture that's a sweet word for those who take God seriously and are along the journey going to the place, to the city of God. Do you take God seriously? Are you on the journey to the kingdom of God? We're going to look at salvation, strength, and security. Salvation, strength, and security. Let's start with salvation at last. Isaiah 51 verse 1. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the sound of singing. So throughout these chapters in Isaiah, we've seen the Lord address his deaf and blind and rebellious people. But in these verses, in these verses, he's speaking to those who have true faith in him. He's speaking to those who pursue righteousness, who seek after the Lord, who know what is right, who've taken his instruction to heart. And I think that it's important that it not be lost on us that it is possible to please the Lord. It's possible to please the Lord. There's always been people back then, even before the time of Jesus, there were always people like Joshua and Caleb amidst a faithless generation. People like Ruth in the period of the judges. People who love the Lord. And this church is full of people who love the Lord. And that's such a wonderful thing. But you see, sometimes it can feel like the Lord is not possible. It's impossible to please him. And I know that I, as your pastor, can even do that to you. That's not my intention. My intention is to let each text of scripture have its day in the sun. So if the text speaks of gloom, it's going to be a gloomy sermon. If the text speaks of joy, it's going to be a joyful sermon. Of course, every sermon is a gospel, good news sermon, because our God is for us in Christ, which means that we, every sermon also needs to address sin. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for us to understand why Jesus came and why he had to die. But listen, it's not impossible to please our God. He's looking for people who pursue righteousness, who seek after God, who understand what is right and take his instruction to heart. And that's who so many of you are. You love the Lord. There's nothing more important to you. Nothing more important. Nothing makes you happier. It grieves your heart that so many people don't seek after God. It grieves your heart when you don't seek after God. And so you're whom he's addressing in these sweet, sweet verses. And he says to us, as he said to the exiles that still trusted in him, look to the rock. Look to Abraham, your father. Look to Sarah, who gave you birth. Specifically, he wants them to remember that Abraham was old, that Sarah was barren, they had no heirs, and God wanted it just that way. Why? So he could display his power. And so he says to them, when I called him, he was only one man, but I blessed him and made him many. And why is that important now? Because he's about to do this similar thing again. 
He's going to take Zion, which was left destitute and in ruins, a wasteland, and turn it into Eden, the garden of the Lord. And so he says, joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. And when you've been where Israel had been, to hear that joy and gladness, thanksgiving and singing were once again going to populate Zion, that was wonderful news. Verse 4. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way. And my arm will bring justice to the nations. The islands will look to me and wait in hope for my arm. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. So God's instruction Justice, righteousness, salvation, and arm are on the move doing something big, far bigger than Israel. Now, a word about each. God's instruction is his Torah, his word, by which we know, people know who God is and what is right and where he's taking the human race and the world. God's justice is his rule. His rule is the opposite of oppression. His rule brings shalom to all who trust him and eventually to the entire created order. So his instruction, his justice, his righteousness. Now God's righteousness is his moral quality. And by the way, this is not obvious to all the peoples of the world at all. But God's righteousness is why life is better than death. And love better than hatred. His righteousness is why generosity is, surpasses greed and honesty lying. And we could keep going. It's all the things that make God holy. Now God's salvation is his deliverance. It's his redemptive, his redeeming nature to mend what is broken, rescue captives, lift up the poor, show grace to ingrates, and God's arm, right? So instruction, justice, righteousness, salvation, and arm. Now God's arm is his power, is his power flexing to bring his instruction, justice, righteousness, and salvation to pass. Because without his arm, without his power, all of those things are just good wishes. And so what Isaiah says about these five things of God is that they are now going out to the nations. To the nations. Now, I know that it's hard for us to hear the shock and size of those words because the Christian mission has always gone out to the nations. Always. From the very beginning. But back then, when Isaiah is predicting the exile and then the return, the exiles are just a few and they're oppressed by the mightiest nation and empire. And yet God's, God's on the move. Bringing all of those things we just talked about to the nations. Listen to what we saw a couple of weeks ago in chapter 49, verse 6. Here's what he says. It is too small. Okay? So it's too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. Okay, so that, that's too small. I will also make you a light to the nations, to the Gentiles. Same word. That my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So I was in chapter 49. And now in, cha and in this chapter, he says, my justice will become a light to the nations. My arm will bring justice to the nations. That's why we go to places like Japan and Mexico, and Ecuador, and Belize, and all the other places where God sends us, because the ends of the earth must hear the gospel. What God is doing is so big, he says, that the heavens are like smoke, the earth will be worn out like a garment, and people die like flies. What's he saying? He's comparing 
the durability and inevitability of his salvation. Nothing in heaven and on earth is more sure than God's salvation. So his salvation is coming. And do you think that the faithful exiles needed this word? Of course they do. Languishing as they were under Babylon. To them, these prophecies seem ridiculous. And come on, it's like, what? But God has more. He always has more. So he goes on, verse 7. Hear me, you who know what is right. You people who have taken my instruction to heart. Do not fear the reproach of mere mortals or be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment. The worm will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever. My salvation through all generations. Okay, so this word is essentially the same one from verse 6. Except that here God identifies specifically what it is that makes his people afraid. What it is, it is that terrifies them, fills them with terror. And what is that? People. Mere mortals. And so he says, do not fear mere mortals, for the moth will eat them up like a garment. Now, moths eating through stuff, garments, clothes, is so annoying, right? You know, back in November 2021, I had been through a long, and I mean long, interview process with Oak Point, And it was finally time to come here on Sunday and preach to you. And so my wife got me uh, this nice gray turtleneck for the occasion. And I liked it. I liked it, so I wore it. And um, I, I got really uh, attached to it. You know, because I felt like that day went well between you and me. And I was like, man, this is so good. And I remember just, just thinking, like, man, this is going to be my go-to sweater for Sunday mornings in the winter. Let me just show you a picture just to remind you of that day, what I'm talking about. Now that, that. Remember that day? Some of you remember that day. Yeah, and I love that sweater. But here's the thing, have you ever seen me wear it again? No, no you have not because I went to the closet the next time to take it out to wear it for a Sunday and there was a big hole right here. I wore it once. I wore it once. I loved it. It had been less than two months and it was ruined. Done. Oh. God is saying to his people, all those people that you fear so much will be like a garment eaten through by a moth. So do not fear them. And then he says, but my righteousness that will last forever. My salvation through all generations. Salvation at last. That's the message that he had for the beleaguered exiles. Is the message that he has for us today. Let's talk about strength for the way. Salvation at last. Strength for the way. Verse 9. Awake, awake, arm of the Lord. Clothe yourself with strength. Awake as in days gone by. As in generations of old. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sign will flee away. So, in light of God's amazing promises that he was making that we just read, the prophet now speaking on behalf of the people calls on God to wake up. Wake up. And so he says, awake, awake, arm of the Lord, clothe yourself with strength. He's saying, wake up, God, and do now what you did before. And he brings up Rahab, the monster. What's that about? Well, in the ancient Near East, which is where Israel lived, there were myths of the gods Baal and Marduk having victory over the sea monsters and the chaotic monsters at the creation of the world. Every people group has their own origin story. And so what Isaiah is saying here is, um, any victory over the chaotic monsters did not come from Baal or Marduk, but from the Lord. 
But Rahab also became the name for Egypt. And so we read in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 7, To Egypt, whose help is utterly useless, therefore I call her Rahab, the do-nothing. So this is at a time, you know, early in the ministry of Isaiah, when Israel was being threatened by Assyria to the north, and they were being uh, tempted to go to Egypt for help. And Isaiah says, uh, Egypt, Rahab, is useless to you. And then after that, in verse 10 here, he goes on and says, Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depth of the sea, so that the redeemed might cross over? Okay, so look at what the prophet is doing. The prophet is calling to mind the biggest acts of the arm of the Lord flexing his creative power to bring the cosmos out of chaos and his redemptive power to split the seas open so that his people could be freed from Egyptian oppression. He's calling to mind these two big acts, creation and redemption. We've talked about him multiple times here in this series, and he's saying, God, do it again. Wake up and do it again. See, when the odds are unsurmountable, insurmountable, God and God alone can make a way. And that's what he's doing in this whole section of Isaiah. He is building, he's been building his people's confidence in his desire and ability to make a way. I'll read you the verses, some of them. Isaiah 40, verse 3, right when the section opens. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. 42.16, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. 43.19, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I just love that about God. Whenever we find ourselves, and I talk to people all the time, and their life feels like a wasteland. But he says, yes, but I make streams in it. 49, 11, I will turn all my mountains into roads, and my highways will be raised up. So God pierces the monsters, splits the seas, and makes a way. That's how God flexes his arm to bring his salvation to the ends of the earth. But it all begins with the exiles returning to Zion, because Zion is the place where God dwells, and Zion is the place where the salvation of God originates to go out to the nations. And so we read that glorious verse 11. You want to highlight verse 11. Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Church, this is a reversal from Lamentations. From the psalm where they're saying, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept as we remembered Zion. This is a reversal of that. The devastation to their national and spiritual identity that had taken them over and taken them away because of their sin. Then sorrow and sighing had overtaken them. But now, he says, joy and gladness will engulf them. They will enter Zion with singing. It's a journey of joy. Let's talk about security and covenant. Security and covenant. Verse 12. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you fear, mere mortals, human beings who are but grass, that you forget the Lord, your maker, who stretches out the heavens and who lays the foundations of the earth, that you live in constant terror every day because of the wrath of the oppressor who is bent on destruction. For where is the wrath of the oppressor? The cowering prisoners will soon be set free. They will not die in their dungeon, nor will they lack bread. For I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. I have put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand. I who set the heavens in place, who laid the foundations of the earth, and who say to Zion, you are my people." So the Lord here turns the tables. Because you see in the previous verses, 
the people, the prophets speaking for the people had been asking God these questions. Was it now you who cut Rahab to pieces? Was it now you who dried up the sea? These were in fact who are you questions? Who are you, God? Aren't you the one that does these amazing things? And the purpose of those questions was to rouse the Lord to act now as he had then. And so now the Lord, it's his turn. Now he asks his own who are you questions. And so he says to them, uh, who are you that you fear mere mortals and forget the Lord your maker and live in constant terror every day? He's saying to them, if you really believe that I dried up the sea so that my people could walk free, then you can't live in fear and forget me. As with Egypt, so with Babylon. I took you out of that monster. I'm going to take you out of this one. And so remember me and you wake up. See, they've been saying to him, awake, oh Lord, awake, oh Lord. He says, no, 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 you wake up. But that's next week's sermon. Here, he has for them a word of comfort. Comfort. He says, I, even I am he who comforts you. Remember how this whole section in Isaiah that we've been studying, chapter 40, opens. What were the first words? Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And so he's saying to them, I'm the one who comforts you. The prisoners, they're not going to die in the dungeons. They're not going to la lack bread. Now I've put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. I who set the heavens in place, who lay the foundations of the earth, and who say to Zion, you are my people. And that last statement is mind-blowing. And I don't want us to miss it. Remember how chapter 50 opens. This was last week. Where he says to them, uh, where's your certificate of divorce with which I sent you away? Where is it? His point is that he has not divorced his people. Yes, he sent them away. He sent them into exile because of their sin. His judgment came on them, which was devastating. But he did not divorce them. He was not done with them. It's the whole point of these 16 chapters in Isaiah. But sometimes it can feel like that to them. They often talk about feeling abandoned more than they feel guilty, which is one of the problems. And so in this whole section, God is laboring to convince them of his faithfulness, of his comfort, of his deliverance. And to that effect, in verse 16, the three things he puts together are mind-blowing. He says, I set the heavens in place, I set the earth in place, and I say to Zion, you are my people. Do you see this? Israel belongs to God like the heavens and the earth belong to God. Think about this. If any of those is not true, none is true. So what he's saying to them is, do you see the heavens? Do you see the earth? Then do not doubt my commitment to you, my people. It's an incredible thing. How God builds the confidence of his people, how he lifts us up. He says, my people are secure because I made a covenant with them. They will return because I made a covenant with them. They will enter Zion again with singing because I made a covenant with them. They're secure, not in their actions, not in their own greatness, their own holiness. They're secure, forever secure in his covenant with them. And so I want to leave you with this, church. Because these verses are a sweet, sweet word to those who take God seriously and are on the journey of joy into his kingdom. Now, the exile that Isaiah addresses refers to the historical moment in the 6th century B.C., where Babylon destroyed the city, the temple, the city of Jerusalem, the temple, and took the people as captives. That's what he's addressing specifically. But exile is far bigger than that. Exile is far bigger than that. Exile for the whole human race began when Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden because of their rebellion, because of their sin. And it's the same reason that Israel went into exile, sin. And it's the same reason that you and I live in exile. 
Now you may ask, uh, what do you mean we live in exile? Well, think about it. We all know this to be true. This is true around the world. Everyone longs, we all long for safety, abundance, belonging, love. We all long for these things. Every problem you have, every sin you get yourself into, it all comes back to this. Every fight you have in your house, it all comes back to one of those things or many of them. Safety, abundance, belonging. And yet, we can't help but feel that we are not safe, that our lives are at risk. We can't help but feel that we don't have enough, that we're not going to have enough. It's what makes us greedy. We can't help but feel that we're not loved or that we're not going to be loved for long or that we're not going to be loved once people really know who we are. And so we hide. Oh, we hide. We hide behind all kinds of facades. And we feel forgotten, abandoned. I mean, the exiles constantly bring that up in these chapters. I've been forgotten. And we all feel that. I mean, even pop stars labor to avoid being forgotten by their fans. This is exile. We could say so many more things, but everyone feels it. We're not safe. We don't have enough. And our relationships are fragile. Now, the return from physical exile for God's people happened by the decree of King Cyrus of Persia. We've talked about this. Before the return from spiritual exile for the whole human race, it would take a different king. It would take the, the work of the servant of the Lord that we've been reading about in different passages in Isaiah. That servant of the Lord would come and do the work that no one else could do. So let's fast forward a few centuries. In the Gospel of John, John tells us that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus and spoke about it. You see, Isaiah knew that the blind and deaf and rebellious servant of God, Israel, needed the work of God's servant who was neither blind nor deaf nor rebellious. That servant would bring God's instruction, justice, righteousness, salvation to the world. He would bring God's shalom to the world by the arm of the Lord. But here's where the gospel comes in. Here's where the, the mystery of the gospel comes in. Is that the way that the arm of the Lord flexed to bring about the spiritual return from exile for the entire human race was not through exaltation and might, but through humiliation and weakness. Listen, we are inching our way toward Isaiah 53. And many of you are familiar with that incredible passage. We're just two weeks away from there. The servant of the Lord would himself suffer exile for the transgressions of God's people. That's the work that Jesus came to do. The righteous suffered for the unrighteous to bring us to God. And so trusting in Jesus is the end of exile. Trusting in Jesus is the end of exile. The work Jesus came to do was to clothe, um, to, to flex the arm of the Lord and clothe himself with the strength to die for us, for our sake, for our lives. Jesus was forsaken and forgotten on the cross, he literally was taken outside the holy city, exiled as a criminal, and killed so that we could be brought into the family of God and never be forgotten. This is the gospel. This is why we sing the, sings, the songs that we sing, and it was so beautiful to hear you earlier today. Oh, we sing Christ and Christ crucified because he's the end of exile for us. Do you trust him? Do you believe him? Do you believe that he is the end of exile for you? And if you do, then he puts you on a journey of joy to God's new world. This is the gospel. Yes. And along this journey of joy, there will be pain and wounds and scars and trauma and all of these things because we're not all the way home yet 
But there should also be the sound of joy, gladness, thanksgiving, and singing. Like my family on its way to Florida. Or like whatever that well-edged in your mind and heart memory that spells bliss for you. Listen, nostalgia overplays sorrow. And we all have reasons to be sorrowful. How could we go to a nation where over 99% of the people are far from God and not be sorrowful? Yes, there will be sorrow. But Jesus puts us on a pilgrimage of joy. And he opened the way with his body. And so if you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ, you've never given your life to him, do you want to stay in exile? In the wasteland that is life? apart from God, where you feel unsafe, insufficient, unwanted, unloved, come, please come, come into the family, come to Christ. You must simply trust him with your life. And if that's you, we we would love to talk to you and pray for you and help you along the journey. And for the rest of us, church, Listen, let's enter into Monday with joy and gladness, thanksgiving and singing. Okay? No Monday blues for us. No, oh, I got a case of the Mondays for you. Back to the grind, living for the weekend. Listen, we don't need any of those mottos. None of that escapism. Trusting in Jesus is the end. The end of exile for us. Every day we're on our way to God's new world and it's a journey of joy. Can we praise him if we know that it's a journey of joy? Yes, it is. Every day we get to help each other as brothers and sisters remember that this is a pilgrimage of joy and gladness, thanksgiving and singing. Yes, sorrow will be mingled all the way through, but it's a journey of joy because the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, has put an end to our exile by his death. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Father, we give you thanks for your word in Isaiah, and how you're teaching us about the spiritual exile that we live in, where we feel unsaved, insufficient. Oh, Lord unwanted, unloved. And yet you tell us that through the death of your son who became an exile, a criminal for us, having done nothing wrong, being absolutely righteous, that in him our spiritual exile ends. As we come to your table now, Lord Jesus, I pray you help us to long for your kingdom, to long for this world that you are remaking.